I remember I was on a podcast in, in May in 2020, yeah. right when the bank economists were saying, oh, prices might fall 30% nationally. And I said in that podcast, prices are more likely to rise 20% than fall 20% because of the low interest rates. And I said, if you look historically, uh, high unemployment is, is not a... It doesn't correlate with falling house prices. It's just not a thing. And people said to me, where did you get your degree? The back of a cornflakes packet? All this sort of stuff, right? And of course, 12 months later, uh, all those guys that got it wrong were now explaining why prices went up. Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week, I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders, and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom, and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Hi, friend fighters. Let me start this week with a very quick analogy. Our car GPS is an absolute masterpiece of logic, but it's psychologically dumb. How we actually behave and how our GPS thinks we behave often don't coincide. The GPS defines our task in simple mathematical logical terms based purely on a couple of variables, getting to our destination as quickly as possible. But it exhibits no sensitivity to context, our preferences, our inbuilt bias and our individual changing behaviours. Our GPS knows everything about what they know and just about nothing about anything else. So everything is defined and purely viewed in these terms, and everything else is ignored. Navigational systems all assume we're trying to reach our destination as quickly as possible. But we're not all average and inert lumps of freight. If we're on holiday, we may wish to take longer, more scenic routes. If we're commuting home or trying to make it to the airport on time, we may choose to take slower back streets that avoid traffic jams. So in this way, our GPS is blind to solutions outside its frame of reference. It focuses on the logical, but ignores the psychological and the behavioral. Sadly, many of our self-proclaimed property experts and forecasters are very similar. They boil complex dynamic property conditions down to simple rational reductionist models that rely on a few metrics and massive assumptions. But as I keep saying, every property and every street and every suburb is different to every other, and so are buyers and sellers behaviors. Now, it's often said that what we measure, we can manage. But there's a flip side to this. What we mismeasure, we can also end up mismanaging and misreading. And this is the danger of relying purely on limited historical data and reductionist models and a small number of metrics to predict property movements. It's why most of these self-proclaimed property forecasters assume everything except responsibility, and they've successfully predicted about nine out of the last two property downturns. Because we all know that property actually behaves more like ever-changing clouds than precision clocks, and property analysis is much more an intuitive art as it is a rational science. So reliable property researchers and analysts are few and far between in my experience, and they're much more like alchemists than economists. But today, we're very privileged to enjoy insights from one of them. As renowned author Dr. Cameron Murray from Fresh Economic Thinking joins us for part two of our great conversation, where we're actually going to deep dive into the wonderful wild world of economics and how it affects property and housing and what this means to you along with a bunch of other interesting topics. So welcome back and let's get invested again, Cameron. Thanks for having me again, Bushy. Cameron, I'm really uh, looking to getting into this on it. We've had a couple of green room chats already on on things of interest, but to, to sort of start the uh, discussion, uh, what mistakes and misreads do you see many making when it comes to housing and property? Oh, that's a that's a good way good way to start. Uh, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of my um a lot of my research is about the supply, and I, I guess maybe we should start there. The word supply can mean about 50 different things, yet we still use the same word. And so one of the uh, big misreads I get is that people 
try and apply economics and say it's demand and supply without being specific about what they mean. So sometimes we mean supply is the stock of existing dwellings. Sometimes we mean it's the change in the stock, so the net additions to the stock. Sometimes we mean it's how many dwellings are for sale at a given point in time on online websites. Sometimes we mean it's the number for rent. Sometimes we mean it's the economic idea of supply, which is a hypothetical schedule of willing sellers at different prices, a little bit like uh, an ask curve on a share market or an exchange. Yep. So we, we sort of misread it because a lot of people are out there pretending to do economic analysis and they want to use the right words, but they don't actually know what they mean underneath it. And I think if we could get rid of the words demand and supply and say if for demand, whether we mean population or willing buyers of property assets or uh, renter households currently active or some more accurate phrase, we might just improve the housing debate at an order of magnitude in terms of its quality and consistency because a lot of the time it's not about being accurate or precise or communicating, it's about seeming like you understand stuff by using economic jargon. So I think that's a big mistake uh, is to get trapped into using economic jargon uh, without being precise about it. Yeah, extremely well said, and the and the uh, misuse of words on the or the lack of understanding of terms and words is is uh, can perpetuate bad thinking around those exercises, as, as unfortunately we get to see in the mainstream media uh, all the time. Yeah. So, so I, well, what I'd love to then uh, uh, put some context around this this whole uh, exercise then is to get your thoughts on what are the major drivers and influences on, on housing and property and, and housing values as well, if we can. Right. Where should I start? Uh, <laughs> I have a whole book on this topic coming out in February, The Great Housing Hijack. Uh, you can pre-order now, so any listener, feel free to find that. But may maybe it's worth me sharing. I've got five big concepts that I think uh, are the uh, are, are useful for un comprehensively understanding do you think it's worth we we go through the five? absolutely yeah we'd love to i think it's, it's okay. pretty fundamental yeah good good idea so so in economics we have this idea called an equilibrium and essentially that what that means is when you have a choice between all two alternatives you choose the one that makes you better off yep. so for example if there's a supermarket checkout two checkouts and one queue has two people and one has 10 that's not an equilibrium because the last four people from the 10 queue can switch to the two queue until the six in each queue, right? And then it's an equilibrium because the, for the next person choosing each checkout, there's no difference, right? But that, that, I mean, that's a very deep economic insight. And I think there are five ways that this applies in property. And I think if you do that, you pretty much, um, don't get surprised by what the market does. It's very uh, comprehensive. So the first one is the asset price equilibrium. And that basically says for every dollar you spend on property, you could spend it on some other asset, right? Yep. So uh, you can put a dollar in a share market, you can put it in the bank, uh, you can put it in property. So they're like the two supermarket queues, property or other assets. And so over the long run, the rate of return on each asset should be the same. And if it wasn't, people would have swapped their money. They would have sold property and bought shares. They would have sold shares and bought property. Yep. And if you look at long-term studies of the rate of return on different assets, it's around 7% for the last 100 years. Pick any yep. asset class, right? Yep. Um, and it must be, because if it was, if it was systematically different, uh, people would swap from one to the other. And so the asset pricing you know, equilibrium what houses, the asset price of houses is affected by what's happening in all the asset markets in the economy, all the alternative asset markets. And that's why, for example, we use monetary policy to influence asset prices, because if the, uh, the return on cash goes down, people don't want to hold cash. They want to hold other assets. So they switch from cash to property. Yep. So that's, that's sort of, I think, the key insight. Yep. Um, part of that too is that undeveloped property, property where you can build houses or can build offices is also an asset right 
it's got a value and it makes a return from capital gains. And you can switch that into cash or you can switch it into a building by combining it with other assets with cash to do construction. So um, I think if you can understand that property is an asset, it's affected by conditions in all asset markets, you know, you're a huge step to understanding the evolution of prices over time. Now, it doesn't mean it's always equal. Asset markets are renowned for being cyclical. And guess what? So is the property market um, because people are second guessing each other and we end up all going one way and all going the other. So that's fine as well. So that's the first big idea I think is useful. The second big one is, well, housing, for example, gets its value from from rent, right? That's the income flow that you get. Where do rents come from? Okay, well, just like the two supermarket checkouts, people have the choice of spending on housing or spending on other goods and services, right? Yeah. And so if you're spending 10% of your income on housing, you might go, oh, I could spend an extra 10% and buy a better house or live, rent a better house or a better location. And so I'm going to keep spending more of my income on housing until there's no benefit from trying to get a better house or buy other consumer goods and services. And the interesting part about that is that for the past 100 years, households have roughly spent 20% of their income on housing. There was a 1911 rent inquiry. Okay, what were people spending on housing? Oh, 20% of their income on housing. There was a 1939 rent inquiry. Oh, what were people spending on housing? Oh, 20% of their income on housing. There were various ones in the 70s because of the inflation, right? Rents were adjusting and incomes and everyone got worried, just as they are now. Yep. And and it's it's likely that this 2023, 20% of income on housing for renters. And of course, the reason rents are going up in a lot of places is because incomes are going up. Yep. They don't go up by themselves. They go up, they go up because people are paying, because the only you're only outbidding the next renter, right? And they're using their income to outbid you. And so across the market as a whole, yeah, it's true. A lot of people are spending a lot of their income on housing, but across the market of a whole, that's not the case, okay? The average is still roughly where it was. Yeah. One of the issues we're seeing now is because incomes are changing at different rates for different types of people, okay, different households are adjusting and moving and outbidding other households whose incomes didn't go up. So, for example, your typical tradie is making like over 20% more nominal income than two years ago. Right, I think they, their incomes for self-employed construction workers was, went up fifteen percent in one year. So you've yeah. got a whole bunch of people making twenty to thirty percent more income. Plus, if they're working more hours, plus if their spouse is working, and then you've got a whole bunch of people who are kind of working those secure jobs um, who haven't really seen any change. And so you're getting this reshuffling of the deck at the moment, but you're getting the rental equilibrium twenty percent. So, so therefore, if incomes go up, rents go up and prices go up because prices are capitalized rents based on conditions in asset markets. The third equilibrium is about spatial. We call it spatial equilibrium or locational, right? So you can either choose to live in one location, one supermarket queue or another. And if the benefit exceeds the extra cost of moving, then you move, right? Of course you move. Um, and so that's why young people move to the big cities. That's why um, internationally people move into Sydney. And that's why many locals move out of Sydney when they get outbid by other people because they can get similar incomes in other areas and they can um, get a lot cheaper housing. So the net benefit of moving is there. And you see that so there's a gradient then in terms of rents within cities, within suburbs of cities, between cities. Um, and that's why there's that gradient. It's an equilibrium outcome of a few people adjusting to sustain those different rents. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense. And that's why, for example, you get uh, increasing rents when you get lots of development in an area because it becomes a relatively more attractive place to live when there's shops nearby and a pool and a school and all that sort of stuff. Yep. So the, the, the benefit of moving there outweighs the cost. Um, the fourth one is called the density equilibrium. And that basically says on the on the production side of housing, on any property at a particular location, there is a density of housing at a point in time that will make you the most money. So out in the suburbs, it might be detached houses on lots that are 400 square metres. Yep. But a few suburbs in, it might be detached houses on lots 300 square metres. 
Yep. And if another suburb in, it might be townhouses. And another suburb in, it might be low-rise apartments. It's not quite, you know, doesn't justify the cost of high-rise. And then in the centre, it's just high-rises everywhere. Yep. And so you, that what that shows is that even if you try and plan, you know, we create our planning regulations to get more density in in regional areas or in outer suburbs, it might not happen because it makes you less money to build a high rise than to build some townhouses uh, because the price per square meter that you sell for it can't justify the cost of building a high rise. And this is one of the things I teach planners uh, when I do training workshops is that you can't just plan for high density. There is a, a, a market limit as well, right? So if you if your planning rule on density is below what the optimal thing is for the market, everyone's going to argue with you to make it higher because they make more money. Yeah. If your planning rule is above what's optimal for the market, no one's going to care, but they're never going to build what you planned for because it's not worth it. <laughs> and you've got to decide what you want to do. If you want to, so we've got an example here in Bean Lee, which is south of Brisbane in Logan, and the town plan says you can build ninety story ninety meter tall towers here. And of course, it's super cheap there. The tallest building's five stories high. And, and even then, given construction costs recently, you probably wouldn't get more than townhouses anymore. No. But it's been 90, 90 meter height limit for the last 10 years. Okay. But then you've got lots of prime locations in Sydney that are preserving uh, more historical areas where you could build more densely. And the question is, well, do we have a reason to protect this or do we not? Because there is a going to be a market here if we change the rule. Mm -hmm. so that's the density equilibrium and the, the two cues here, here are basically for any property owner should i go up an extra story and does that is that worth the extra cost of going up the extra story yeah. or the extra density like in terms of detached housing lots you know do i make more money selling um uh 10 400 square meter lots or 2200 square meter lots you know there, there'll be a, a right number there and the final one is, is where there's a lot of debate at the moment is called the absorption equilibrium. And the absorption is kind of the word I use to say it's not supply, it's the rate at which property owners take up opportunities to build houses. And essentially the two queues, supermarket queues there, are uh, build today or build tomorrow, <laughs> right? Because you don't have to build. Mm. Um, yep. You don't have to build. The property is a right, not an obligation. To build so you choose when to do it and how quickly and if you're building too fast today you'd actually make more money taking that last dwelling out of the queue today and putting it into tomorrow's queue and so what that means is that when prices are rising quickly in the cycle everyone wants to build at those periods because that's the time when putting stuff into the future is not worth it and when prices are soft or not rising then you've got this benefit from delaying and, and that's the absorption equilibrium. If you get that, you know, if you can understand that, you can sort of see why the idea that, oh, we can make all the houses cheap by just letting people build houses doesn't work because they don't want to build faster. There's a built-in speed limit here because if they built faster, they'd make less money tomorrow, right? So across all these property owners in the market, there is an optimal rate to convert undeveloped property assets into developed ones. And, and, and I think really understudied you are, and i think there's a there's an underlying principle that sits uh, uh under and wraps up everything you've just shared and and that's mm -hmm. the important recognition and understanding that that property is an asset it's a it's actually oh. an investment asset uh and and, and 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 a lot of people i i think tend to either forget or ig ignore that exercise particularly when we're talking about housing affordability and, and social housing and everything else. And, and it means that, uh, to, you know, in reinforcing everything you've just shared with mm. them, which has been fantastic, by the way, uh, that uh, left to the private sector, which uh, all housing in this country now is pretty much provided by yeah. the private sector, they're only going to uh, push the button on uh, increasing the supply of housing in whatever format we want to call that uh, yeah. when it's profitable to do so. So, uh, so I, I'd, I'd love to, I, I guess now leverage into, into that yeah. because for as long as I've been involved in property and it's, it's been many decades now, uh, Cameron, 
Uh, there's been this never-ending debate about housing affordability, accessibility, rental crises, <laughs> and the supply debate. Uh, can you share your thoughts on that? And, and I know you've done some work on this, looking at historically, which we touched on in, our, yeah. in the first part of the exercise. So I'd love your thoughts on all this. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, it has never stopped. It is the age-old problem. I'll give you two examples just to reinforce how normal this is. Okay. I know the media likes to say, oh, something happened last week, therefore it's abnormal, even if it happened, you know, every week. I, I, I still don't understand what makes something news first not news, but that's just a different question. In 1836, Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, famed biologist, arrived in Sydney Harbour on eight, his ship HMS Beagle in January in 1836. I'll have to, could be 1832. I always mix, mix those years up. But the <laughs> oh, I never change. knew he came to Australia, so I've just learned something, mate. You so, did, uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you go. You can find his diary from his ship, and the first paragraph of the first day's diary from being in Sydney, he writes... The number of, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. The number of newly built homes is truly astonishing. Nevertheless, everybody complains about the difficulty of procuring a house. What do you reckon the population of Sydney was in 1836? Be very small. What, what, what are we talking? 15,000. 15,000. And here we were, 15,000 people, wide open country, no planning rules, no limits on anything. And everybody's complaining about the price of housing. Okay, here's another example. Um, in online games where they create housing markets and property systems, these mega multiplayer online games, they're often prone to housing crises, rental spikes, asset price spikes, and a chronic shortage of housing. All the complaints that we have are replicated in computer games when we replicate the property market. So I reckon it's probably not something that's happened recently. I reckon if these five equilibria, if you understood them, you would make sense of, oh, income's really jumped. Okay, rents will probably go up. Oh, interest rates went down. Oh, asset prices will probably go up, even if rents fall for a while. Yeah. Oh, okay, prices have stopped rising. Oh, probably people will stop building houses for a while as quickly. Oh, okay. It all it all fits together. And it makes sense not only of Sydney in 1836 or Victoria in the 1880s land boom or in Sydney in the 1910s when there was a rental inquiry or again during the Depression. It just makes sense of it all um, as the way economies adjust. Like the property market is such a large part of the economy, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's you know between construction between rents and imputed rents on owner occupiers you're you're talking a quarter of the economy or 20 percent right we spend 20 percent of our income on rents so roughly speaking 20 percent of the economy is devoted to maintaining producing and renting housing um so it's really tied to these macroeconomic cycles so yeah and i mean i, I as back in 2003 i remember the Prime Minister's first home ownership task force was a big one. They proposed shared equity schemes. And then late in the 2000s, boom, the ACT adopted a shared equity scheme called land rent scheme. And you'll notice that there's a lot of that going around this cycle as well. Yep. Um, seems to be the last part of the cycle. Shared equity becomes all the rage. Yep. Um, so, yeah, if the, the cycle is sort of the other forgotten part. So, yes, property is an asset, yeah. which means... Uh, which means there's this great symmetry in property markets. So someone's cheaper rent is someone's bad investment return, right? And I think politically, if we don't acknowledge this symmetry, we're going to just keep this pretend game going for many more decades. Um, you know, uh, imagine imagine if rents fell 50%. Imagine if we did orchestrate them. Oh, okay, so the $10 trillion worth of housing in Australia is now worth $5 trillion, yet the... Um, five trillion of mortgages is still worth five trillion like we're just basically making ourselves poor from a, a an asset sort of side perspective well, it doesn't I, really I, make sense does it It doesn't I, and 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 again i love your thoughts on this that, that that's never going to happen that there, there's so much of our 
personal equity. I, I think it's something like 54% of uh, uh, yeah. the, the average person's equity is tied up in the value of their home. Mm -hmm. From a government voting perspective, if nothing else, in terms of po politicians making sure they stay in power, they're never going to let that happen, are they? What's, what's your thoughts on that? No. So 67% of households are owner occupiers. So yeah. you already got two thirds there. Yeah. And I have a friend who's hilarious. He goes, oh, I really want prices to come down. But man, as soon as I've got that contract, I want them to go up. Right. Um, so 60, so you're already two thirds, right? And in addition, there's about 2% of rent vesters. So you've got 69% of, of households, basically. Yeah. 18% um, of households altogether are landlords. And so they're typically the most politically important. They're either politicians themselves. So the average politician has two and a half investment properties. So, so you know, I, I've estimated that there's, there's about 16,000 councillors, state politicians and federal politicians in the country and if they had two and a half properties each a million bucks you're talking 13 billion dollars right just from them yeah so they're not going to orchestrate a, you know uh, crushing their own balance sheets are they no way um, and then you've got to consider their family their friends their social networks they own you know hundreds of billions of dollars so so that's not going to happen and electorally it's not going to happen um, and monetarily, it's not going to happen because we manage the economy with monetary policy, which relies on the housing price transmission mechanism, right? So we kind of, when, when we get to the nitty gritty, we realize that we can keep prices up with monetary policy. If really there was a collapse and construction stopped, we would boost, we would try and boost prices in construction, right? Yeah. So we've got this automatic built in counter mechanism. So, yeah, on the whole, that's just a, a fairy tale that I don't think anyone really believes, but it's a convenient thing to say day in, day out if you don't want to do anything about housing, but you're copying political flack for, for example, the rental price adjustment that's happening right now. You've got to be seen to be doing something, but then deep down going, well, this is just what property markets do, but I can't say that to anyone because I've got this 30% of upset people who are renters yeah. um, and I want them to vote for me too. Yes, beautifully said, and I, I think that's the the issue here. That there's a the uh, politicians are, and and it's it's no different now than ever it has been. But they've got to be perceived to be doing something, yeah. uh, so that they talk about rent freezes and 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 all of the other junk that goes with that. But I think that the really interesting thing for me, and I, and we we started touching on this mm. in our green room discussion, was uh, government's role. In this, because I, you know, yeah. I'm old enough now to remember the days back in the the seventies when governments were actively providing social and public housing to look after, provide that safety net for those that were in strife, and not uh, as we are now pointing the finger at the private sector and making it their issue when the private sector is profit driven and therefore they're never going to uh, build housing unless they can make money out of it. So, uh, what, what's your feeling on all of that, and and what do you think government's role needs to be if we're serious about uh, the, right. the ongoing discussion on this whole issue yeah yeah so so just so let's just define the problem a little bit we've got two-thirds of households that own their own home in the private market and they're happy basically if prices go up if, if they fall we'll bail them out with a cheap mortgage with our monetary policy yeah. so now we're down to 30 percent <laughs> of households a lot of them uh for the typical renter you know, quite a few of them end up being homeowners. So we get about 100,000 new first-time buyers each year. Yep. Um, and a lot of them are just young students who, from wealthy families who are going to be fine as well. So we, we're really talking about a slither of the population, 20%, say, that are really going to struggle renting for a long period in their adult life. Yeah. And what do we do for them? Well, nothing, basically. Uh the private market has an incentive to to maximize, right? Property owners want to maximize their returns, not minimize them. And so we can see that in, for example, the new build to rent type models that are coming along. Those property owners don't do super bargain basement places. They do top of the market, top of their market, which is how they make the most money. Also, you'll see them with um, you know, gym memberships included and, and office, you know, hot desking spots and all this stuff to try and maximize the, you know, it's for rent, for the right tenant, it does maximize value for them. Yeah. But it's not the tenants that are struggling to rent in the private market no. or are being forced to move further and further from the city when their rents come up for renewal. Yep. And so we've got this 
you know, small section of households. And, the, you know, the trick is home ownership is like rent control because the landlord is always giving you a favour and never putting the rent up, right? Yeah. So we can either encourage home ownership or we can provide a landlord who will just not put the rent up on them, right? And so uh, what works around the world and has worked historically is for government agencies of various types to build houses for people and rent them at cheap regulated prices. And if we had, say, 15% of people in a system like that, we'd only have 15% left in the private rental market. So if rents doubled, the issue would be halved because there'd be half as many people exposed to that rapid change in rents. And so, you know, I'm a big fan. I I think governments should build roads. I don't think we should only have private roads. I think driving would be very expensive and people would complain about the rent for for driving, right? Totally. And yet somehow, and and we want the government to do the power lines and the sewers and the stormwater. But as soon as we hit the front fence, oh, we're incompetent. We don't know how to build anything. Okay, you built all this really big, difficult stuff all the way to the fence, and now you just can't put the house on it. You don't even have to do it, you just pay someone. So I'm a big fan of public housing, social housing, whatever you want to call it, regulated price housing. I yep. think you can do it two ways. My preferred way is a parallel ownership system. Yeah. So sweat equity Singapore. top set up your men or pardon me? A sweat equity type arrangement or oh or... no no so in singapore for example you buy public housing you purchase it right and it's yours and you can trade it again and move to a different one yeah and so it's like a parallel scheme yeah and only people who qualify who don't own property elsewhere who are residents who could buy a new one from the public housing provider can buy in the parallel system so you just create this Love cheap parallel market a little bit like public schools right we have public schools you can move to another one if you move and uh, you don't pay for it and you can get out of it if you want you can sell it you can get out of there and go to a private school you can sell your public housing and move to a private one and so that's sort of what i propose and i think the the, the reason to for the ownership model art rather than the public landlord type thing is just purely and going back to what i said in our last conversation i'm um, into this efficiency i'm an analytical person who is into efficiency and um when you're managing other people so this is what we call an economics principal agent problem right the renter knows what the house is like but the landlord has to make the decision and what to pay and how to fix it whereas if you buy it then it's your decision right and so if you have a parallel home ownership system you buy it at a cheap regulated price you own it for your lifetime. If you want a new kitchen, you do it. If you want, if you don't want to fix the leaky roof, you don't fix it. But you you avoid all the fights because there's no one to fight with. Yes, yeah, so you have if you have a public landlord, just like we have fights all the time with private landlords, you're just replicating that again, right? So uh, and that that sense of ownership uh, and control, that, which is an important human need that that comes agreed. from that, and therefore the likelihood that those properties are going to be better maintained and looked after because that that sense of participation rather than the victim exercise at the at the end of the chain is got it's yeah. going to have a whole raft of benefits I would have thought I agree and I think the trick is the earlier you get into this the more you realize oh I have an asset I can look after it maybe that changes your mindset in general about investing in assets right and um so I know in Singapore once you turn 21 you can apply as a couple to buy off the plan from the public housing provider and I interviewed a couple there who just paid 350,000 Singapore dollars for their new apartment. And I said, well, what would it cost you in the private market? Now, well, there's nothing really here because 80% of dwellings in Singapore are from the public housing provider. But, you know, you, you have to pay a million bucks or more to get a private a condo or an apartment. And so, um, look, there's, there's heaps of variations on it. I'm not saying that's the perfect one. Australia would have its own variation. You'd have new uh, detached houses in the suburbs. You'd have lots of townhouses through the middle rings and you'd have apartments. You'd have a choice. And just like you have schools distributed through through the cities and no one thinks that's impossible, you have um, lots of little public housing options. And the, the you know, and people can resell it and trade and move. So it's got the built-in flexibility. So I think if we're really serious about avoiding this ongoing 100 plus year, 200 year issue in housing, you either get everyone to, you, you, you either 
you get more people out of the market, either because they've previously bought and they're owners or they're renting at a regulated price or they're in some kind of public home ownership scheme. The fewer people exposed to those rapid changes in market prices, uh, the better we all are. And I mean, that's the long-term benefit of owning. That's why we own in retirement. Imagine being retired and having to outbid all these new youngsters moving into your suburb, right? That's why we think it's good. And that's, you know, that's why property is an asset, right? It's giving you these future benefits. A lot of people say, in superannuation, oh, we shouldn't let you buy housing. It's not an asset, right? It's not providing you an income in retirement. I'm like, yes, it is. Not renting is an income. Totally. And 500, 500 yeah, bucks right. a week of not spending is the same as giving you 500 bucks a week and spending 500. Well, it's like, better than it's that because if you had tax into it, then uh, it's actually well, yeah. more important than that. So uh, yeah, it's, it skips the middleman, right, of, of paying these extra cash flows. So I think if anyone's serious about housing, it's minimizing uh, the private rental market or and having um, non-market options for those who need it, oh, while recognizing that probably 85% of households will still be in the private market, either renting or owning, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but, yeah, and, and, and no one loses in the, that exercise. That, that That's the that's key. Right. The thing you, know, from- you don't pick political fights either. You're not saying, "Hey, everyone, I want to crash the value of your biggest asset." Hey, landlords, I want to, I want to, you know, take away what you can charge your tenants. So you're avoiding the political fights as well, um, yeah. which I think is underappreciated. And so I don't know why it hasn't been more popular. And I think a few governments now, so in Queensland where I live. The state government's acquiring a lot of housing and, and sort of ramping up. There's, they've come under enough pressure. Yeah. But here's here's the issue, right? I don't think you can ever solve these adjustment periods. So when everyone's income's rising, even if it's only 5% of people in the private rental market, yep. some of them are going to get squeezed out onto the street Yeah. because of that adjustment. Yeah. So in terms of like the homelessness during these adjustment periods, you know, you need some kind of buffer stock of unoccupied. For example, in Brisbane, we have these COVID quarantine facilities and there's a political debate about, oh, should we offer these to homeless people because they've got beautiful kitchenettes and showers and, 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 and the council wants to do that, but the federal government doesn't want to give them credit and all that sort of stuff, right? But, you know, we, we saw during COVID we can do stuff. <laughs> Uh, So if we want to deal with the homeless part, like that very small end point, well, we just have to do it, right? We put everyone up in hotels when they were homeless during COVID. I'm sure we could come up with something better, more long-term. I I agree. I Respond to these periods. The the question for me is the political will uh, because, uh, you know, these solutions are are out there. You don't have to dig very hard to find them. Uh, You've done a lot of research, so you've looked into the nitty-gritties of it, but... uh, Mm. For, you only got to jump on Google uh, and <laughs> spend a couple of hours and you'll start to come up with, with thoughts that haven't been embraced. Why don't we have the political will, Cameron? Look, yeah, you know, I wish I wish I knew because when it comes to pet projects, um, we seem to have the will, like the Olympics in Brisbane. Hmm. All of a sudden, oh, we can build stadiums and accommodation for athletes, not accommodation for homeless people or people getting squeezed with rent, but we can definitely do it for athletes. And all of a sudden, things click into gear. And I just think, hang on a minute, you want to spend how many billion on this all of a sudden? Um, and yet all the rest you're going to ignore. A so two week, a two week event. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Two-week event in 10 years' time, oh, we're going to spend $180 million acquiring this site. We're going to spend $30 million relocating the dog racing track. We're going to spend $5 billion or more, like an undisclosed number of billion on the main stadium. Um, in Queensland, we have the casino. We, we, we conveniently sold off 10% of the CBD that was owned by the government. Didn't put any housing on it, just a casino on a secret deal for your mates. I think Sydney may have a casino on the harbour. Who knows? Um, so it's, it's pure political will. Right, it's pure political will. Um, I just think that for the the um, how do I put it? Just remember, sixty seven percent of people aren't paying attention because they live in their own home. Yeah, maybe some of their kids, maybe not. Maybe they feel like they're wealthy enough that their kids are fine. So again, I think it's just a minority issue that is hard to tackle. Let let me give you an example. So in Switzerland and Germany, renters have very high protections. 
right? Very high legal protections for and, and they're they're life, lifetime rents too, aren't they? They're not like yeah. one or two year cycles. Uh, yeah, so your obligation after a certain period, you roll into this long term obligation, and there's only sort of three reasons you can force someone out of a rental property. So it's a very, you know, and I, I'm a fan of some of those rules for slowing down the rental market, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I might come back to that. But in those countries, it's fewer than half of people own their own home because yeah. renting is such a stable and secure thing. Yeah. And so in those countries, you do have that political constituency for renters and public housing tenants and all those things. Whereas here, it's the, the political calculus is the other way around. Yeah. 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 It's very it's, hard. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess let, let's think about it in terms of political clout. While there's a lot of lip service paid to the homeless uh, exercise in, in terms of real impact, uh, it, it's not going to get a politician to bang the table because, it, it, given they're only there for three years or a bit more, it doesn't really matter. Now, I'm being a bit cynical in that statement. Yeah, but, uh, uh, I, I agree. Oh, if it came to their suburb, things would happen very, very quickly. Like, let's be clear. <laughs> um, but yeah, as a general rule, and 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 I think it's also worth acknowledging that. Yeah, the homelessness increase we're seeing in Australia is a global one in 2023, and it's also a, a normal part of the cycle. I yeah. remember in the late in the 2000s, right at the end of that cycle, there was heaps of homelessness, and and then it disappeared. Right, we hit the end of the cycle, prices crashed, all of a sudden there were houses everywhere. Everyone wanted to rent up everything, um, and and there was a stable 10 years, and now we're having that point in the cycle, but we're having it globally as well. Uh, it's not just locally and i and i think perhaps i'm just speculating here that because the cycle doesn't it, it sort of solves itself many times after a few years yeah uh that it's just not never hits that threshold of political sustained well, political action I, I think what's i mean I, I, and you would have heard this before but the the thing that resounds for me is what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history uh, mm -hmm. because the, the the cycles are there and and already we're forgetting that only a couple of years ago we had a cataclysmic uh, global shock uh, yeah. that was more about reaction than the reality, by the way. But that's that's yeah, another discussion uh, that has thrown everything out, and 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 almost the cycles in in most developed countries uh, are actually in sync now yeah. as, a, as a consequence of that. So that homelessness exercise that we're experiencing here is also being experienced in the US and everywhere else that that has got, gone through that process. But if we if we step back and thought, well, okay, well this, this is actually a normal part of what's happening, and this is the transition in the cycle so we've just got to come up with solutions that can accommodate those homelessness drivers and i and i do think it's a government responsibility uh because yes. again relying on the private sectors it's just not going to happen uh it would then alleviate this and and would get it off the headline so we can focus on more important things in this this endless debate but uh one other thing i'd, I'd love your thoughts on because again mm -hmm. there's a lot of media uh, chatter around this at the moment and uh, and that that relates to the uh, migration and and population mm -hmm. influence on housing and you know there's a lot of people now saying close the gates and, and everything else uh, mm -hmm. and what, what's what's your thoughts around all of that yeah so this is one of those areas where everyone likes to call me names because i say that you know over two hundred thousand net migration is probably a little bit high and probably a hundred thousand is closer to an optimal rate if we're thinking in terms of that efficient overall efficiency yeah because right? because you need one dwelling for every two and a half extra people um so so that's got to be factored in i guess uh in terms of what we're seeing now we're seeing the same spike in immigration in canada the uk australia uh not so much the us but it's a post-covid catch-up in countries that are essentially trying to boost immigration and i think there's a at the end of the day, there's a little bit of a political incentive to conceal um, a poor economic conditions with extra migration, um, which is fine. I think most people acknowledge that. Um, but in terms of affecting the housing market, I think where I, the, the data suggests to me it, it has large but temporary effects. And let me explain why. Um, everyone who moves here has to rent or buy from only the small pool of dwellings that are currently advertised, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so rent rental houses turn over every two years on average or 1.5 yeah. years or whatever it is. Yeah. 
And so you only get, you know, whatever one one uh, 18th of the number of drugs, so one 18th of 33%, so about a percent of <laughs> um, rental dwellings each month are available, right? Yeah. And yet yeah. everyone who wants to live somewhere has to rent from that 1% of rental dwellings. They can't just not live somewhere for a year until all the other dwellings come up for sale. So you're squeezing them through this little narrow doorway. And so what that means is temporarily you can get these big deviations of this rental equilibrium. So people will spend more of their income on rent because literally everyone's trying to squeeze through the same doorway. Yeah. But over time, what happens is people adjust and they move into um, larger households. So more people per dwelling or people don't move out. And so we, we change the composition over time as the stock turns over and that brings the effect back down and we get back down to that 20%. So in 2006, we massively boosted immigration and rents increased, but then we had the 2010s construction boom. And in fact, rents were falling in Sydney from 2017 till the early 2022. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're still over 200 immigration because all those adjustments had happened. We go, oh, actually, because of this, we can actually build more houses. Oh, because of this, people are moving in with their mates. Oh, there's actually a, for example, student housing industry growing in response to this. So we adjust. And so just like it was okay in 1923 to not worry about the big Australia of 26 million in 2023, I don't think I'm worried about the long-term outcome. It's just these short periods where the adjustment has large effects on everybody else. And so I think if we had... Um, immigration fluctuating around a hundred thousand rather than fluctuating as a, over four hundred thousand or something this year. Yeah, um, we, we it would not be noticed. Everything would be easier in terms of expanding infrastructure because every house. Uh, a friend of mine, Peter Phibbs, is a professor, emeritus professor. He says, "Well, every house approved by the council is also an obligation for infrastructure." Yes. They don't just, they can't, like, their council has obligations to have infrastructure standards. So every time someone comes, yeah, we've got to build them a house. But yeah, every kid needs a spot in a school. Every street needs to be sealed. All the stormwater has to be dealt. All, everything has to happen as well, right? And and the standards today, very different. So yeah. if you go back to the, the 1960s and 70s, we had a, quite a high population growth and we had high immigration periods there. New estates didn't have stormwater. They didn't have sealed roads. Schools just went to church halls, right? Uh, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have internet fiber. We didn't have a lot of stuff. We didn't even have sewers in most of the cities till Gough Whitlam in uh, yeah. it was the early 1970s was his was. big achievement, right? And so, yeah, okay, just putting houses without electricity or toilets on sticks is easy. Uh, and people say, oh, we historically had high rents population growth in the past. I'm like, yeah, okay. Do you want to just build unsealed roads and drop toilets and no anything? Or do you want everyone to live to the standard we've now come to expect in 2023, which means we're going to have to do a lot of investment for every additional household? And that, that's so a really important uh, point that you're making there is that what people aren't factoring into their thinking is our expectations. Because what we expect now as normal is very different from what's what's happened in the past. Yeah. So, uh, and that comes down to the the type of housing, the size of housing, what goes into that housing, the services that, that go yeah. with that. I mean, it, it, we as you, you've touched on, I, I think we live in the best country at the best time uh, in the world, uh, and, and a lot of us uh, take that for granted, sadly. Uh, but uh, when we impose those ever escalating expectations on on the housing environment then there's no great surprise that that, that the cost and otherwise uh, uh, is something we're we're chasing but if we then put it back into the transitional cycles that that you've very well overlaid over the, the discussion which puts some really good context into it then mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden it's not not a one off uh, uh, problem that's that's new this has been happening every time the uh, mm -hmm. economy has gone gone through these sort of changes so uh yep. so you know I, I, I lo love your thinking around that um so let me just wrap up on the immigration i think yeah we'll, we'll look i think it's going to come off next year i think there's yep. a bit of catch up yep. um i think the political pushback we're seeing now will tighten up a few of the really overly generous type visa classes yeah and i think in uh in a few years time this will sort of wash out rents the, the sort of the rental squeeze will have eased off 
from that effect. So I think the effect is temporary, but it's going to last two, two to three years. So after three years, we'll, we'll be like, oh, okay, it's not that anymore. Yeah, no, it beautifully said. Now, it's something that I, I know you've, you've spoken about on on your blog and and in some of your own podcasts in recent times is the the NIMBY and the YIMBY phenomenon being, you know, not in my backyard and yes, mm. in my backyard. Uh, what's your read on on its influence on on housing and, and property and the evolution that you're seeing in in that, that sort of a, a thought response? Yeah, I, it's hard to say that it's had substantial policy effect i i like to say we've been up zoning like crazy for 20 years yeah i used to work in the you know infrastructure charging regime for the queensland government checking on all the council's planning schemes and and what they're what they're charging what infrastructure they're building so i'm very aware uh, that we've been trying to uh up zone like crazy you know allowing more density on each side but um you know the yimby nimby thing is a bit of a side show it's a bit of a culture war yeah that doesn't have tangible yeah. you know useful information in there so for example the melbourne yimbies very interested in better urban design in melbourne great i actually really like the the interest in urban design and what should the public realm should look like and i think that's great yeah but what they've proposed is sort of looks like the regulations that already exist they just basically restated, oh, we need planning rules that allow for this, but then do this. And then and I'm like, have you have you read the planning rules? This is exactly what all the planners have wanted for 20 years. Um, you know, the soft uh, intensification, the transit-oriented development, the complementary infrastructure, like this is exactly what we're trying to get. And it needs a lot of rules to help coordinate that, right? Like Just yeah. like the road needs lots of rules to coordinate traffic and, you know, in high dense places, we need lots of rules to coordinate this. So I, I do feel like it's a little bit of an import from the California sort of culture war. You know, we have very different planning systems to them. The rights of um, locals are not as high as many parts of the United States. Yeah. And um, so I just don't, really um see it and i think in in terms of the economics the yimbies are always missing the absorption equilibrium that i talked about they yes this idea that the market doesn't have its own decision making it's only the regulator that does something and therefore if you upzone you get you know upzone for ten thousand houses you get ten thousand ignoring that the market has its own decision making and optimizing process yeah. so i think there's a bit of a blind spot there but i do like the uh, attention to better cities and urban design and multiple types of transport and all that that's great i love it um count me in but in terms of using planning policy to make houses cheap that connection i don't think exists and no fact, if, but... if we got the beautiful cities they want people would pay more to live there right <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and and let's be honest. If we again relativity in the equation here, if we compare Australian cities to most cities I've travelled and 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 spent around the world, my God, uh, you, you can always improve. Uh, there's no question, but we're mm. we're we're sitting uh, pretty well in that context. Um, something I'd, I'd, uh, before I, I want to return to your book. Uh, yeah. But I, it's something that it, it, a, a lot of people uh, listening get invested uh, have an interest in what's likely to happen uh, to property and housing moving forward, given a lot of them are either investors or looking to invest. Uh, yeah. In the context of your economic read, uh, yeah. what do you think is likely to happen to property value movements, both a short, medium and, and long term? Um, well, if we are interested in nominal movements, so ignoring inflation, so benchmarks against your, for example, mortgage nominal value, yeah, uh, I, I think there's going to be a surprise, surprise boost. I don't know if we're live, we're we're in the middle of it right now. I think a lot of people have been surprised. The 2023, after the interest rate rises last year, I wrote an article last year that. Uh, or was it earlier this year in maybe March? And I said, I'd, I'd read this book called The the Land Boomers about the 1880s Victorian land boom. Yep. And I said, one of the most interesting things there was in the second part of that boom, all the banks got nervous and put their interest rates up thinking, oh, okay, we've got to, don't want to add more risk here. 
Yeah. And they doubled their interest rate essentially from 3% to 6% when the yields were 3% still or 2 point something percent on housing in Victoria in the 1880s. Yeah. And they still had a second price boom uh, in the face of these higher interest rates. And I actually remember that in the 2000s boom as well. Yeah. We put yeah. interest rates up from 2003 all the way to 2009. I think I was paying 9.7% or something just before the financial crisis. Yeah. Um, where it was like 5.5% at the start. Yeah, it was. And so, and we still had this final stage cycle. So uh, this year I've been telling people, hey, yeah, interest rates have gone up, but we, you know, no one's panic selling, right? So we still might have a final blow off stage where there's few trades, but pro higher prices. Yeah. And now the question for me is how long is that going to last? Are we done with it? Because I think in some parts of the world, they are done with the second phase cycle some parts of canada and the united states yep. or are we going to have another 12 months or 18 months of it um and then the question is are we going to have a big correction or is it going to be small with a lot of monetary policy response just like australia after the financial crisis didn't have the huge panic like the united states did because we're not as leveraged as they were then yep. uh they're not as leveraged as they were then yeah uh, so they're not going to have a similar crash they might have one of these more orderly yeah. shallow recession type situations yeah um so uh, look the, it's all about the timing yeah i don't really know but my suspicion is we're going to have a, a little rise now and a bit of a correction and then relatively flat for a few years until the next uptick. Yep. And I don't know how big the correction will be or how long it will be. And I don't know how, when this current little surge in prices will finish either. But if you look at the patterns, that's the pattern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think that within the pattern, and, and again, this is, I'm talking a, a personal philosophy here because of my uh, belief that uh, because, uh, in real terms, we're not talking a property market. We're talking a collection of properties. Uh, the mm. ability to influence the value of that property, and you know, I'm putting my architect's hat on now, uh, to to create your own economy around that particular property. If you're really satisfying to uh, buyers' needs, you can insulate yourself to a certain degree from the the overarching. Uh, oh yeah that's occurring so uh, i always say look get, listen to the news and take it on board uh th that's useful uh but uh, don't make it a self-fulfilling prophecy because you have the ability to control the value of a property asset if you're clever about what you do in that in that context so i totally uh, agree uh, you, that's the beauty and that's why i think a lot of people in property are attracted to it because they can go oh the granny flat rules have changed oh okay and then a few years later they're like oh this tenant's moved out, we're renovating, we're fixing, oh, we'll put the granny flat in and we'll manage it differently. And now it's even more income, less of an issue next cycle. So you can really, you know, be much more hands-on or, you know, maybe you know the local, uh, re the real estate agent says, oh, well, air conditioning is going to get you a lot more rent. Oh, okay, well, I'll put air conditioning in, right? You get better tenants. with. So you can definitely be more hands-on and you can definitely, you know, build trust with reliable tenants over the long term. So if yeah. they're under market, you know, they're not going to be under stress either in the downturn. Uh, one of my tenants I had when I bought my first place stayed for 10 years and then left to buy his own house. Yeah. And um, I just, the value of having that relationship and that reliability was, was much higher to me than the cost of active management and the turnover. Yeah. And it worked well for both of us, right? So that is that is one of the good things about property is um, being able to add value, build those relationships, make your own choices and, and smartly insulate yourself from the broader market. There are always deals in the downturn as well. Totally. 100%. So, exactly right. No, beautifully said. Now, I, I, just, I just want to transition back to your upcoming yeah. book, The Great Housing Hijack. And, and thanks for sharing those sort of five 
uh, underlying principles, of the economic principles that we can apply to understand what's happening and where, where we are in the context of things. But uh, again, I'm really looking forward to, to reading a copy and, and I'll, I'll, I'll get you back on uh, once it is released right. a little bit deeper. But uh, I'd love for, for you to, beyond those principles you shared with us, you know, why have you written the book? What are the key messages that have come out of it? And uh, uh, mm -hmm. what are the relevant takeaways that particularly property players and investors uh, can gain from it? So uh, why did I write the book, for starters, is because uh, it's called The Great Housing Hijack because I think the debate has been hijacked. No one actually wants to talk straight anymore in the debate. Yeah. And this is my attempt to bring the debate on course by just talking straight. This is, you know, these are my five economic equilibria that apply to property. Um, you cannot escape these forces. Property is an asset. Um, that's one of the big points and the debate is perverse because the politicians have incentives the media likes clicks uh you know for all these reasons and then a little a historical look as well as you know these aren't new debates right yeah. and we've we've solved most of these issues in other areas you know we had similar debates about healthcare in the 1970s oh people can't afford healthcare Okay, well, we'll build public hospitals and if you need something, you get it. Just like we could build public houses and have a, a buffer stock of hospital rooms just in case. We can have a buffer stock of, of, of housing just in case. Totally. Um, it's, not, it's not that hard. And so I just wanted to sort of talk people through you know, why what you hear in the press and in the political debate is not concrete economics, um, <laughs> where the blind spots are and... And if you really wanted housing to be cheap, um, you would have public options because not everyone does want it to be cheap and the private market works for a lot of people. And I, and that's a message too about picking fights. Yeah, you know, It's a political dead end, right? Yeah. It's a political dead end to pick fights with the most wealthy and influential people in your electorate and the exactly. majority. So why don't we focus on the things that win? And, and, and in fact, I'm thinking of next year writing a report called The Doing State which is all about we try and regulate, but we don't do. But if to regulate, you have to be so competent that you could do it better than the people you're regulating, right? So so when I worked in the Queensland government, we regulated the, the rail network that we had sold off to, we privatised the central Queensland rail line. I'm like, well, now we have to regulate them to get the outcome we just got when we owned it. Why don't, why did, like, we had more money than them. Totally. Why sell it? We don't need money. We're the state government, right? We have way more money than the guy that paid us. It was making us money because it's an asset. That's why they paid us. I don't understand. And now uh, we've got to regulate them. Don't, don't start me on the privatisation debate. Uh, so, I, 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 uh, j jumping in there, Cameron. Yeah. I, <laughs> I spent some time with the Commonwealth government. It, it was my last phase as an architect, actually, and I uh, mm -hmm. took on board the, it was called Australian Construction Services uh, back mm -hmm. in the day. And I, I remember John Howard just came into power not long after I took the role because that they were looking to privatise the, the department by bringing in uh, private players, which I was one of them, to manage the operation more as a business rather than a department yeah. because it had to make money uh, in that context. And I remember one of the uh, – I sat down in front of one of the politicians at the time and said, look, I, I really don't think you should be uh, selling the farm, uh, particularly in relation to housing in relation to education, in relation to health, because they are the fundamentals that have built this country. Uh, yes, let the private sector uh, settle Join everything. In. But those, yeah. those key yeah. fundamental human rights, basically, is what made this country great uh, by by providing those things. Why, why wouldn't government continue to underpin the economy by looking after those essentials and allowing the, the private sector to then then drive the rest of the economy? And the, the, the response was, well, if there's more than five people in the yellow pages, and that, that shows you how long ago that was, <laughs> government's not no longer interested in doing it. We're going to, we're going to, so that was, that was pretty much the blanket response so so i, I think sadly uh yeah. it's to be a, a a rethink on on all of this uh but yeah, again, I, yeah. good I, well I, I want to sort of encourage that rethink because um we, we are missing the fact that what we're trying to do with some of these regulations like regulating the electricity market that we just created from scratch yeah. right is actually more difficult than just doing it yourself yeah 
And nobody appreciates this fact that writing the rules for a bunch of smart people trying to rip everyone off is actually harder to it, it make writing rules to get the exact outcome you want is actually harder than just owning the assets and doing the outcome you want. Yeah. And so I, I you know, I'm going to write a report next year, just p- putting that out there. So you, you'll appreciate the book. This is, this is what I say. And let me give you a couple of things, two things. One on homelessness, we go, Oh, this homeless person, they, you know, they, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, whatever, you know, you can't just do whatever. Oh, you've got the sniffles. Oh, come to a public hospital, $5,000 a night, bed and we'll look after you i'm like hang on a minute so they get a five thousand dollar night bed if they get the sniffles and we all think that's great but if they're just out in the street and cold or hot or just need a shower or someone to help them get their life in order no sorry you're on your own i just don't understand how we drew that line so clearly and of course there are lots of good organizations doing homelessness outreach i'm not going to say yeah um that, that that everyone's being left alone i even know i'm in brisbane and the council does a really good job and and often, in terms of that privatization question, sorry, I often tell people, would you rather call the Brisbane City Council or Telstra yeah. to get some service? And I tell you, Brisbane City Council is very good. Telstra is very bad. <laughs> uh, one is public and one is not. One's even a government with their own political sensitivities. And, on. and the last thing on this privatization, and this gets to the heart of the, the conundrum because we sell assets, right? Things that yeah. are worth money that make money. When we hosted the 2018 Commonwealth Games at the Gold Coast, this Queensland government smartly said, oh, we don't have to build the athletes' village. We're going to have the private sector do it. So the private sector built a bunch of 1,200 dwellings on on former public land. Of course, they gave them discounts on the land and whatnot. And and then afterwards, it's become a build-to-rent housing project, which is great. But... The private sector funder of that is the Abu Dhabi government <laughs> through the Sovereign Wealth Fund. So the one of the Emirates thought, you know what's a good investment? Building houses in the Gold Coast. You know what our government said? Oh, building houses in the Gold Coast, bad investment. How can those two things be true, I wonder? They can't be true, right? It's just all politics mixed with ideology, mixed with whatever. I don't know. Wow. Yeah, I... I and I think it's a win on both sides of politics. People like it when the government does stuff. We just like it. We hate it when they interfere with our business. So if you want to do something, you do it directly and let the private sector what do whatever they're doing to fulfill their markets, right? Don't, yeah. Regulating them to get a social outcome is super, super hard. It's like the hardest problem in economics. Yeah. And yet we and, think it's easy. Yeah, well, and and you know this as well. And having travelled extensively, I, I think we're the most over-regulated, over-compliance-based country in the world, uh, to the point where it, it's almost ridiculous, actually. Uh, whereas, if as you say, if some of those fundamentals were were run and managed by by government, then a, a lot of that stuff would go away. So, uh, very interesting. Look, uh, I, I could talk for hours with you, um, <laughs> uh, Cameron. Uh, the more I talk to you, the more I realise we've got very similar outlooks. But I, uh, I want to jump in and we will get you back because uh, there's a lot of subjects we've only just touched the surface of. But uh, I, I want to switch into the second round of the ambush where I'm going to give you the uh, the <laughs> cigarette and the, and the blindfold to, and ask you another couple of quick questions. Uh, first of those is what's your favourite quote and why? <laughs> oh, look, I think if we're sticking to investment, I think it's accumulate appreciating assets. That's yeah. it. Three words. It's that's if you digest that idea, you are going to be able to manage your money and invest. Yeah. Um, that's and that's from my old man. Uh, I don't know where he got it from. Probably read it in a book the day before he told me, but it stuck with me. <laughs> well, it's a good one, and, and I, I love the simplicity of it and the power of it. Uh, on the literary field, apart from reading your books, what's the top book that you'd recommend we read and why? Look, I mostly read really dense academic papers and reports these days. Uh, I tell you what, I as a more general response, there's a lot of great um, archives of historical government reports in the National Library and in Trove and online that you can find. So you can go and find 
the 1939 report into the land rents in New South Wales or the housing rents. You can go and find these things. One of my favourites was the slum clearance investigation in Victoria in 1932. You go and find these old reports and listen and all the same economic arguments are the same, same as now, 100 years later. Uh, it's super interesting to read um, that the, the debate is essentially unmoved. And on that report, it's super, it, one, of the, one of the lines is, oh, the private sector is not going to make cheap housing for people who previously lived in slums because they're in the business of making money, not providing cheap housing. And I just thought, hey, wow, isn't that interesting? We should add that to some 2023 reports uh, and just motivate a, a more extensive public housing option. Well, it just, just reinforces that the more things appear to change, the more they remain the same. And uh, once people uh, get their head around those those cycles that you've you know shared with us today and that framework uh, that you've shared with us today, then things are going to like, make a, a lot more sense. Uh, the, the next qu quick question around uh, back in the investment space, what's mm -hmm. both the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received? Well, I'll just use my first answer for the best piece, but the worst one, I think, is about minimising tax. Yeah. There is a lot of attention in Australia to minimising your tax, ignoring the fact that the more money you make, the more tax you pay, right? Yeah. So to minimise your tax, you have to lose money <laughs> somewhere. And yes, it's okay to negatively gear, and what you're sort of doing is hoping that the losses you... you, you, you um, turn cash flow losses into capital gains and yep. they're taxed differently. Yep. But at the end of the day, if you still make more rent, you still make more money. <laughs> yeah. So you shouldn't be in the business of uh, minimizing tax. You should be in the business of maximizing appreciation, total, total return, right? Okay. And sometimes that means you pay tax and sometimes you pay less because it's a capital gain. Yeah. Um, but I have noticed... A, a weird focus on this as a first step and not just an incidental part of a bigger total return maximizing problem. Totally agree. 100% agree. Yeah, no, very well read there. Uh, final one of these is uh, what's a personal happy habit or, uh, or daily discipline that you employ that's contributed most to uh, your success today? <laughs> Uh, the word, to be honest, I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you about Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's been a terrible habit, but it has introduced me to a lot of good people, opened a lot of doors, built my reputation. Uh, I think we got introduced, he got introduced by someone as well. And yeah. I'm going to, so it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's a bad habit if you, when you start. It takes a while to learn to use it well and block and mute people, but it's a good habit if you want to be following directly academics, uh, good analysts, journalists, and getting the news sort of unfiltered from the people who create the news. And you can just reach out to anyone and, and ask them a question, and it's a really interesting space. So the, the habit is neither good nor bad. It can be good, and I think... What I've done now is tried to refine it into a better tool and not a time waster unless I really want to just veg out and waste time. It's better. Yeah, time. it's a good point. And I think the the clarity there is is who you actually uh, follow mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, if you make it too broad, you can, sim you can swim in a cesspool in, in Twitter or exit yeah. your own. But if you're very focused around what, what you're – Wanting, wanting to get and the people that you respect and following them, then you're right. You, you, you're getting very short, sharp uh, insights without having to plow through uh, thousands of bits of information to get a sense of what's going on. So, yeah, no, beautifully said there. Uh, to summarise our great conversations in the previous episode and today, what, what would be your key takeaways, Cameron? Uh, I think... <laughs> the well, the big thing I've noticed is how you and I, through different journeys in property, have come to very similar views on quite a range of topics. And, and so that's the obvious takeaway. And then the question that raises is, why hasn't everybody else? Or why hasn't the political class? Or why, you know, it's funny, I, I often think the 
political class, we go, uh, even inside existing public housing departments, they go, we don't have any money, we can't invest, we can't do that. And then they go home and go, oh, let's leverage into a $2 million house in Sydney. What a great asset to have. I'd love to invest in that. And then they go back to work tomorrow and go, oh, we're too poor. We've got all these inner city city houses in there on the balance sheet. We don't know what to do. And there's this real weird mental shift. And so that's so, so why people don't sort of get the basic, like when they've got their investor hat on, they sort of get the basics and there's a big incentive to understand the market. And then when they've got their public policy or work hat on, there's a big incentive to forget all that. And, and I think both of us have been able to sort of try and see bridge that and, and see it for what it is. So that's probably uh, the big takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. I, I think the, at, at the public level, the, there needs to be a big shift in uh, accountability and responsibility. That That's where I think the, there's almost been a, a baked in uh, approach where the finger's always pointed in the private direction. Uh, yeah. We're in the position we're in, I think, because of the neglect uh, of taking action by governments yeah. in, in key uh, essential spheres. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, uh, anyone listening in those those areas might might take up the gambit on that because there's an obvious opportunity sitting there right here, right now for all of us. So it is, it's not easy, though. Uh, let no. me just quickly... Uh, the Kiwis did this. They had Kiwi build, and they gave it these ambitious targets as a public housing builder. And they struggled for years, right? Because um, they were trying to build below market, right? And without losing money. Yeah. And they couldn't do it. And so they had all these political pressures on them. And it turned, it took them a few years before they realized, oh, we have to subsidize this. Oh, if we can schedule better and get all our tradies on board, we can actually do things more efficiently. So, so that I think they, someone listening, correct me, but I think they fired a couple of the senior people in these teething stages, right? Because of this, political pressure was too much um, and, and it was unrealistic. Um, yeah. So I think that has to be acknowledged that you can't just turn around. Like the private sector is bad at building houses too, right? Yeah. Uh, they they go broke all the time. And yeah. to, for expect, to expect us to turn around and switch on the tap to beautifully made system is, is wrong. We're going to have a five-year teething period. The five to 10-year period is yeah. where things are going to click in and start operating. Yeah. Um, but who, who's got the political... Um, ability to withstand that pressure and push through those years i don't i don't know but w what i have proposed to fast track that um lend lease is selling their residential communities group 1.3 billion they got offered for forty thousand undeveloped housing lots and i have proposed why doesn't the government buy that in the fu housing future fund they created and then yeah. just accelerate the, they don't have to start the institution all the hard bit is done yeah. and of course no one everyone ignored that as well except for my twitter followers um well what can you do uh that, that's, well, that's the a, reality of implementing yeah, these things right i wasn't aware of that and that that's a very obvious uh it's a lay down was there it's staring them in the face but that, that that's the the issue that that i find a lot of the time the the solutions are right underneath our nose but they're almost too easy and too simple that that there seems to be a perception now well, that there's got to be a better way. Uh, and You're right. That that happens in housing a lot. Sorry, just one more story. A friend who's working for state government, they're, they're trying to get a bit more housing in some regional areas. And they, I said, well, why don't you just go and build, buy houses or build them? Like what? There's nothing stopping you. Yeah. And he's like, oh, everybody wants something different and someone wants to do this and the council wants to do this. And who's going to choose if it's below market, which tenants can live? I'm like, oh, okay. So you don't even know what you want yet, right? But if you knew what you want, you could just do it. The rest is, I think, just navigating the politics. Yeah, that's right. You see, exactly right. Final question, uh, Cameron. If I ask you to get invested, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I, I guess it just means... Um, we, I think we'll circle back to maybe what I said in the last conversation what i would tell my kids about don't do nothing be be working towards something uh whether it's a new job whether it's training for something just be invested in your life like get in don't play computer games and hang with your mates do something that's investing career building you can always change it but don't don't not be working towards something um professionally 
Yeah. Uh, don't you, you don't retire. Just keep working towards things, right? Um, because opportunities come when you're invested, when you're attempting things. Totally, yep. Yeah, extremely well said. So, uh, for the others like myself who really resonated with what you've shared with us uh, over the last two episodes, Cameron, uh, how can listeners find out more and get more involved with you? Uh, the best place to keep track of me is fresheconomicthinking.com. Uh, you'll, it's a subscriber newsletter. You can sign up for free or you're welcome to become a member, a paid member. I'm trying to evolve this into a, a think tank, independent in, public intellectual type outlet for myself. And you'll find out about the books. And if you're on Twitter, at Dr. Cameron Murray, so D-R Cameron Murray, all one word. Um, and you'll see me there every morning asking a question or posting a chart, just checking in on, on the economic news of the day. I love it. Uh, we'll make sure we have all of that in the show notes so it's easy for people to just click on the link. Uh, but I just want to take this opportunity to really thank you for sharing uh, your time and wealth of wisdom with us, uh, Cameron. And, and for those that are listening in and would like to keep the conversation going on property and housing economics, I uh, just uh, suggest that you join and jump into the Property Hub Collective Interactive Facebook community by clicking on the links also in the show notes where you can share your questions and comments with other like-minded uh, people in the property and investment game that uh, can do that in a circle of safety without ever, ever feeling like you're going to be sold to. So uh, thanks again uh, for enlightening us, Cameron, and I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation uh, here on Get Invested on and Realty Talk and, and, and other forums whenever the opportunity is there. Thanks, Bushy. I had a lot of fun. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design. By getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration, along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red-hot property investing news and insights, direct from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge, and I look forward to seeing you next time.